All right. I think I know everybody in the audience except for the one in the back. Um, so I'm, I'm Scott Yoko. I'm the director of research computing at Harvard. Um, my group is housed out of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And so um, it's a group of about 20 or so of us. The one slide to tell you a little bit about the group. Um, so in research computing, we have a number of different services. High performance computing being about a third of what we do. Current clusters about 82,000 cores. Um, there also exists about uh, 2 million or so uh, GPU cores in that space. Data is another big space. Um, there's about 38 petabytes of storage. There's just about every file system known to man in our storage infrastructure. Um, and we're trying to consolidate that down a bit. Um, and then we also operate a fairly large virtual machine environment um, for the community um, that is not participating in the high performance computing space. So that's about 600 research groups that we do services for. It's about 4,500 uh, active accounts. Um, of that, about 425 are actually cluster users. The rest are just storage only. And so this, this exists in the manifold of having instruments that are attached to workstations and we provide the storage for it and then a lot of the computation just happens in-house inside of their uh, their lab or it could be what I'll talk to you about today is labs that are creating a lot of data who can't do that computation locally they must also do it on the cluster um, overall we operate about two megawatts of power worth of equipment um, which I know very well now um, as that's in my budget and so I, we've tracked that uh, pretty pretty quickly um, and then the group itself is split up of the, the staff is split up into a few different groups. There's a uh, the, uh, computational support and facilitation group. Um, that's kind of like the front of house as well as the people who are like the consulting group that helps build workflows and complex. They all used to be researchers, so they understand the workflows. And then there's a uh, software as infrastructure. So all of this HPC storage, virtual machine, all that environment is orchestrated by this group and they the, the, pup, the pup, puppetization of all of those different deployments. Um, and then there's the system engineering group and the data center operations uh, group. And then there's a new group that we're creating, um, research software engineering. So we have a manager of research software engineering position that's open, so tell your friends. I'm happy to have anybody apply to that. And that will be this own business function to really revolutionize the kind of stuff that I'm showing you today where we're moving data from instruments onto a cluster, gets checked into a database, the workflows automatically would get kicked off. The end user would, would, would not have to know all the complexities of a cluster. So if you take somebody who's in life sciences or psychology or something, they're using these types of tools. We want to automate a lot of those workflows. So that's what a lot of this group will, uh, will do in the future. So I have a larger talk that I normally give that's about where does the data come from? Um, and in I was a computational chemist. I was in the group that's the top. It's all numerically intensive. All the data is created normally on the fly, and then that's scratch data that you get rid of. There's a whole other group um, around uh, external repositories. As Internet 2 grew up and the transfer of data became much easier, you have, um, you know, like uh, gene sequencing, uh, or the, I should say bi the bioinformatics groups, the climate modeling, seismic modeling, um, even part of the astrophysics type stuff, where all this data is being slushed around on the Internet. And then when I came to Harvard, something that I realized that I hadn't been exposed to um, was that there are some seriously big instruments that are creating lots and lots of data locally on campus. And that's what I'll spend the time today talking about. Um, so one of, the, one of the groups that I'll focus on is just the Center for Brain Science. Um, it's an inter interesting center on our campus. It's the intersection of biology, engineering, and computer science all together. There's faculty from different domains working together on joint projects. Um, and they care about all the things, the diseases that are a part of the brain and how, the, how does the brain actually operate. So I'll, I'll give you a holistic view of, of we, we go from the very beginning parts of the behavioral part of the brain all the way to the end of how does the circuitry work. Is it, so the behavioral part um, is an example from uh, Vincy Alvesky's group. Um, and the idea here is that we want to create a mechanism so that learned behavior can be understood. And so our subjects in this case are, are a suite of, uh, of rats that they engage with, and rats have a really good, uh, quick learning. But what's difficult is in the past, you would use a different environment that they lived in and move them to this training environment and back and forth, and that disrupts learning. And then later, um, the learning space, when they actually 
um, whole brainwave uh, processing off of the thoughts that they're having was in a different environment. So we wanted to create a singular environment that this would be the same. So one of the guys in my group um, started looking into that. So essentially what we have are these uh, these housed environments that they have. There's a, there's two Raspberry Pis that are, are hooked to each one of these boxes. So they generate data because they have cameras on the video. There's also all sorts of analog types of devices that are attached to them. Um, this is analog for or providing water and, and there's different levers in the box that the, the, the rats have to do these sequences. And when they do the sequences, they get rewarded with more water. Rats love water. <laughs> and so you can get them to do all sorts of interesting experiments. They can, they can do things when they hear different sounds. Um, and it's not just simple like, do you hear sound or not? It's like, do you hear this sound pattern? And if you do, then you get rewarded. And in, in doing this, they're also recording not just their tapping of the lever, but the velocity in which they tap, the angle at which they tap from, so later, this becomes a really complex amount of data that needs to be analyzed. So there, here's an actual picture of one. There's two of these that are in an IKEA uh, box. There's a whole bunch of IKEA boxes, and this is what the lab looks like. So when I say scale out, like two Raspberry Pis only have they only have individually a 100 megabit connection, but there are 420 Raspberry Pis in this setup. Right. So this gives you in this aggregate data type of information. So that's just the switch stack in the room. It's in that space. So you can see at the top, there are two cameras. And you can see the amount of data that they would generate. And then there is a difference in like a higher resolution camera that's attached. It's a USB camera. Um, so all of that in a single uh, you know, seconds is, can be up to 5.5 gigabits of data that's created from those devices. So that's an example of large amount of data that's been created. Right? So in that kind of data flow, you cannot just, you cannot just assume the network is going to be perfect and just send the data over the network directly. So all that is actually collected locally and then transferred. So another example of experiment would be these brainwave recordings. So once the learned behavior is set, then they do brainwave analysis. So I'll just skip the details here and show you what it looks like. So a probe is inserted, and in this there's 128 different tracks of brain recording. And this is where the computational stuff becomes a little bit more expensive. To do this clustering algorithm to get the signal out of the noise and to get this clustering, so these represent different types of thought patterns, right? A lot, a lot of computation has to be done to do that. And these, these are run continuously, streaming. So each one of these, and there's ten of these units. Each one of them can stream um, about a about a terabyte a day, and so it ends up being about a gigabyte a second, right? Data continuously. So then after all of that learned behavior, after we've recorded the thoughts, and we understand that those thoughts probably go with these behaviors, we take the, the subjects and they um, unfortunately get terminated because we want to continue to do science with them. And then what happens is the brain actual tissue gets chopped up into 50, mil, uh, 50 nanometer thick slices, automatically put it on, deposited on some film. And then that film gets run to a multi-scanning electron microscopy. This is 61 heads of scanning electron microscopy. Every two seconds it takes a picture. There is a number of uh, strips that are on the plate. Um, it goes through. And this is the amount of data rates that that thing can create. So when you talk to people who are doing cryo-EM and they talk about big data, we, I, we can almost laugh at them because this does in an hour what most of them do in a day, right? Or se gene sequencing stuff. So this is a challenge to keep up with. This was the first one of the multi-head uh, Zeiss instruments um, that was in production. That's 61 heads. The current ones are 91 heads. The next ones will be three times that, probably. Right. So as I'm talking about three times that, right? That's an order. Like there'll be an almost an order of magnitude change when the new instrument comes out. So this is what it looks like. So each one of these is an image of the brain tissue. Each one of these is from the individual head. Each one of these pictures has to be aligned so that the two-dimensional overall that is aligned, right, as a single image. And then the individual stacks then have to be glued together as a, as a whole two-dimensional stack. And then the two-dimensional stacks then have to be turned on their side and created the three dimensions. And that's where the computer scientists come in. Um, oh, yeah. How do we collect all the data? The reason why I'm here in the DDM booth. I forgot this slide. Uh, so each one of these uh, workstations is directly connected at fiber channel. So there's um, like 10 of these workstations connected in. And then these are back end at dual 10 gig to an network. And um, then the, the one major change that we had is this is actually running native uh, 
GP test clients on the Windows nodes. And we're doing that so that in the process of getting to larger instruments, the data the data flow inside of the workstations wouldn't be governed by uh, Samba as a protocol, whereas the GPS protocol will be much more efficient to load the data through. Um, so in doing that, then all of that data is collected um, directly onto the GS7K, uh, and then that data is uh, hooked up to some, some data transfer nodes, and there's some other workstations in the lab that they do some QA, QC before they send data off, right, and it goes to the compute cluster. And how do we get to the data to the compute cluster? Well. I'm trying to convince them all to stop doing this manually with rsync. My friend Ryan in the audience is doing some cool stuff with Globus with this uh, product called Automate. And so we're trying to, to do something like that where they where when the stuff comes off of the uh, instrument, the, a task could pick it up and move the data. Maybe it requires some kind of first quality control and then they would move the data. Um, the process right now, the, the problem right now is this can only be so large because the infrastructure inside of, of the, um, the room that's next to the instrument can only support a certain amount of, um, of kilowatts. And so we can never collect all the data that they have for a month in the same room. We have to ship the data. So that's how we get it out. And then they do processing. And then they have to archive. Right. So right now, they, they luckily have a contract with Google. And they're archiving um, literally petabytes of data with them. But that's just a short-term project with Google. So this is what the end result looks like when you send um, your data and you use an ungodly amount of GPUs in a box, um, you can take each of those two-dimensional pictures and you can use the segmentation type of algorithm um, and create all of these different um, connections to so these are the axioms and neurons. So then after they have that, then you can use a machine learning algorithm, to, like a neural network, to figure out what is the actual neural network. Once you have that, now you have signatures of electrical processing and you can go back and look at how does that relate to this particular subject that we just recorded the brainwaves, which were from one thought. So the idea is that we would understand in the end that this thought creates this brain signature that goes through this type of uh, pathway in a physical brain. So that's kind of the end result that we're hoping to push for. And so big thanks to the group for um, all the work that they do with these two different experiments so far.